Hi everyone, Nubkex here. Welcome back to Nub Raids. I'm bringing you the info and my thoughts on the champions that are going to be boosted in a 10 times summoning event during this summon rush event for the uh, Operden Clan Father Fragment Fusion event. This is kind of important because I think for most people going for this summon, uh, you're going to need to get shards from the summon event, from the summon rush. So you're probably going to need to pull some shards to get pieces of Operden, to get some fragments. So we will see. Uh, normally would not recommend um, <laughs> would not recommend summoning during this sort of summon rush. It looks like it's going to have relatively poor rewards. But let's see. Maybe the champions are good and they'll make up for it. Right. Let's dive in. Let's see. I'm on my free to play here, by the way. Uh, which almost has Elhain to 60, so stay tuned for that video coming soon. Right, so the first that we're going to be looking at, the theme of these I think is very much weakens being a big deal, and uh, also a bunch of champions that will help earlier game accounts big time with their Fire Knight progression. Obviously Fire Knight on newer accounts, one of the most difficult dungeons. First up we have Tarshan, one of the weirdest looking champions in the game. Uh, Tarshan comes in his A uh, A1, Attacks one enemy, 25% chance to provoke, 35% chance when booked. It's okay. He has Soul Shrivel, an AoE attack, three turn cooldown when booked, 100% chance when booked of placing 25% weakened debuff for two turns. His A3 demonic possession, 60% increased defense on all allies, and 20% turn meter fill. That's on a four turn cooldown when booked. And then back from where his passive puts strengthen on him whenever his HP drops below 50%. That has a four turn cooldown. Honestly, Tarshan, I mean, he's got really solid base stats. To me, he feels a little bit underwhelming. He's going to be an okay sort of support for your team. A bit of turn meter, increased defense. AoE weaken is, is good. Um, so he'll do a bit of damage. He'll do a little bit of provoking. Uh, he's going to be okay, but probably not too, too impressive. People like him reasonably well. Looks like probably an average of about 4.5-ish overall. Maybe a bit higher in some of these locations. So he's okay. If you guys have used Tarshan, let me know. Maybe he does decent damage. Um, he seems okay at best. Nothing to get overly excited about. Next up we have, uh, in the Sacred Order, we have Talia, an old school champion. Uh, I think she's also one of the coolest looking champions of the game with her big uh, greatsword. Looks awesome and badass armor as well. Yeah, I think she was one of the poster girls for like the game when it first came out. And again, I think she's pretty decent for Fire Knight. Her A1 hack and slash attacks one enemy three times. So that's obviously very good for knocking down that Fire Knight shield. You can run her with the giant Giant Slayer Mastery, and it's going to do pretty good damage with that three hitter. Then her A2 is an AoE attack, gives her 25% increased attack and 30% increased crit rate for two turns, and then attacks all enemies. That's a three turn cooldown when it's booked up. And if she's with Phoenix on the same team, it has a 75% chance to place uh, bomb debuffs with AoE. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. Just by its default, though, it's a decent AoE hit. The increased crit rate's kind of nice. Can make her pretty easy to build. You could leave her at just 70% crit rate. You get her early game. Uh, you might not have an increased attack buffer on your team. That's any good. So she's going to make it easy to guarantee those crits. She's increasing her own attack, and she'll do a decent hit. Then her A3 Awesome Presence puts counterattack on her for two turns, and then has a 100% chance when booked of putting Weaken on all enemies. Kind of weird it doesn't say all, but I believe it is all enemies for two turns. That has a five-turn cooldown, so it's pretty long. Um, she also has a crit rate in dungeons by 15%. So again, I, uh, you know, looking at her as a later game account, I think there's very little, apart from maybe this bomb thing, that's sort of jumping out to me when you get later in the game. But earlier on in the game, like on my free to play right here, if I was to pull Talia, I'd actually be pretty happy because she's gonna come in. She's gonna help me in Fire Knight in particular, knocking down that shield with counter attack. Whenever the Fire Knight hits you, she immediately gets a triple hitter off and will start knocking down his shield. AoE weakens decent to bring, a decent AoE attack. I think early game, she's good. She's got terrible HP, but she's decently tanky. Um, yeah, I, I feel like she's a, a pretty average champion. Uh, good early, but not, not that great after. The one thing that I think is certainly interesting is this bomb debuff with Phoenix. I think Phoenix is very good. Now he's not boosted in this uh in this 10 times event i think phoenix is much better than talia is kind of looks like almost like he's got a pokeball a pokeball there almost um but he has a very hard hitting a1 hits twice massive damage uh, he has an aoe block buffs attack as well and then he has a single target decreased defense and decreased speed i do think that you know if you're an earlier game account 
they might be good budget options that can be useful to you in dungeons, like Phoenix, very good for uh, Ice Golem in particular because he can block revive with his uh, with his A1, which is awesome. And he decreases bomb detonation cooldowns with Talia on the same team. I think the two of them together could be a, a decent budget option for Hydra, right? You go into Hydra, um, she's going to do this AoE attack. AoE bombs adds a lot of damage to it. Phoenix puts out block buffs, decreases the bomb cooldowns. I think it's an okay combo. And then the block buff stops her counterattack from being stolen, which would be pretty terrible. You don't want those heads to get counterattack. I think it's a, an okay option. Nothing to get excited about late game, but it's an okay option. And then the final regular epic is going to be Arndolf, who was just added into the game. Arndolf, he likes horses. He's got a big horse on his shield. He has, you can't really see, he's got a horse on his helmet. I think he's got, he's got a horse on his thing. He's got a horse on his belly. He's got horses everywhere. Uh... I, I kind of feel bad for him because he likes horses so much, but the poor chap doesn't have a horse. <laughs> he doesn't have a horse. I wonder if they'll add mounts in at some point in the game. Is that going to be like two years time? Like mounts are now added in the game. Arndolf can ride, I don't know, Dracomorph into battles. Mm -mm. Spoiler warning, Dracomorph, we'll see. But uh, yeah, his A1, Iron Great Club, attacks one enemy, 20% chance to provoke, books to 30% chance. Not that good. Uh, Daunting Violence is A2, AoE attack. Puts weaken, also has a 25% chance of placing fear. This book's up to 100% chance to weaken and a 50% chance to place fear on a three turn cooldown. I actually think this is a pretty decent move. Uh, it does okay damage. And yeah, AoE weaken early in the game on earlier accounts is hard to get. So that's useful. And a 50% chance for AoE fear isn't terrible for a bit of control. And then his A3, I think, is the highlight for Fire Knight, Wall of Metal, three turns when booked, 30% reflect damage buff on all allies for two turns, and a counterattack on him for two turns. Uh, the thing that this does is you go up against the Fire Knight, he hits you, and each of those reflect damage ticks knocks one point off the shield for Fire Knight. So he's going to be really good to help you get through Fire Knight. Uh, he's tanky, so you can bring him into Red Affinity Fire Knight, and it's not even really going to matter. He will still survive, and the reflect damage still does its thing. He'll still go in and counterattack as well to knock an extra tick off that Fire Knight shield. So, I mean, he comes in, he does Wall of Metal. You're basically probably going to get at least six ticks off Fire Knight shield more if you have allies with multiple attacks on their A1. So yeah, I, I when I first saw this guy in my review for these champions when, when Arndolf was first released, I wasn't that impressed, but a lot of you commented and said, actually, he is pretty decent, you know, especially for that Fire Knight. And I think that is true early game. He's going to be a solid option early game for sure. You don't even need to take him to 60. You can probably leave him pretty tanky at 50 and he's going to still do a decent job. So yeah, early game, I think he's great. I think when you get later in the game, uh, he's really no use at all. <laughs> no use at all. Okay, now we're moving into the legendaries. Uh, so the first one is over here. Suzerain Catan. Suzerain Catan. Interesting champion. So he's A1. I think all of his attacks are AoE here. Temporal Nova attacks all enemies, has a 50% chance of placing decreased speed for two turns. His A2, Hex of Years, AoE attack when it's booked up has an 80% chance of pacing Weaken for two turns and also puts decreased defense if the Weaken is not placed. So a little bit strange, a little bit wonky. You know, you're you're going to get one of the two, basically. Then his A3 removes shield, block damage, and unkillable buffs from all enemies, then attacks them, puts 100% heal reduction on all enemies for two turns, and the buff removal cannot be blocked or resisted. Um, and yeah, so it's an attack with a nice bit of removal. So I think for Arena, he's not a bad option early game, right? Every single attack is AoE. Um, you know, removing shield is quite nice for some, some arena stuff. If you're going up against Crisks, if you start hitting those in arena, that sort of thing, or Brogneys, it's really not bad and you can't resist it, uh, though you will want to build him with accuracy, I think, for this one as well. Bringing Weaken on an AoE, decreased speed on an AoE. I think he's actually pretty okay for some Hydra stuff. It's not bad. So yeah, I, I think he's he's okay. I think he's okay. He brings you 33% ally attack in all battles. Um, yeah, he's all right for some spider stuff. He's going to be okay for arena. He can be campaign farmer, faction wars. I think he's okay all around. Fairly average legendary, I would say, but he can do some stuff well. Uh, then for the final two, we're going to Lizardman, where I think there's one that's okay and one that's extremely good. So first up, we've got the okay chap, and that's Roxam, who looks... Really cool, to be fair. He looks awesome. Attack-based, legendary. Uh, and he's got some weird stuff with Veils, right? So his A1, Chroma Shift, attacks one enemy. 
can fill his turn meter, 60% chance to fill his turn meter, 10%, and a 60% chance of putting Perfect Veil on him if the attack is critical, and you would build him to crit. So he's putting Perfect Veil on himself just for one turn, but it's still there. His A2 Jungle Ambush books to a three turn cooldown, attacks one enemy, fills his turn meter by 50%, has when booked, 100% chance to stun if he attacks under Veil or Perfect Veil, 100% chance of putting Sleep if he attacks without Veil or Perfect Veil, and it also gives him Perfect Veil for two turns if he attacks without that Veil or Perfect Veil. There's a lot of text in these tooltips, let me tell you. Flicker Step then is a three, four turn cooldown when it's booked, uh, attacks all enemies, and when booked, 100% chance of putting decreased defense and weaken. Decreases the cooldown of Jungle Ambush, so this move, uh, by two turns. If he does not have Veil or Perfect Veil, he will attack one enemy and uh, has 100% chance of putting decreased defense and weaken for two turns before attacking. Um, uh, but just on one target, right? It's only a single enemy attack, and then it gives him perfect veil afterwards. Doesn't reduce the cooldown. So he really wants him to be on veil. It's an AoE decrease defense and weaken attack, which is nice. And then his passive puts block debuffs, strengthen on for uh, on this champion for one turn, and continuous heal for two turns whenever he receives veil or perfect veil. So he kind of his kit works by himself. It's quite an interesting kit, right? The idea would be he goes in, he does his A1. Boosts his turn meter, stuns, uh, or sorry, he no, he go in, he do his a a two here, fill his turn meter and put a sleep, gives himself perfect veil, which gives him block debuff, strength and continuous heal. Then he comes in the next turn, he does an AOE attack, putting decreased defense and weaken and reducing the cooldown of this uh, uh, down to basically ready the next turn. He goes in with this again and he does a stun and he's sort of rotating through it. Uh, you could also put him into the arena with a champion that already applies Perfect Veil, and then he could lead off with this attack to put decreased defense and weaken. He, by the way, has crit rate in Doom Tower battles 23%. Let me know if you've played with Roxam. I feel like he's really weird. Uh, I'm not sure really how good he is. Certainly early on in the game, getting access to, you know, uh, AoE decreased defense and weaken is, is phenomenal. That's super good, but it's just a little bit awkward to set it up. It takes him like a turn. Uh, even though he gets turn meter, it takes him a while to set it up. And he places these after his AoE attack, so it doesn't boost his own damage on that. He's sort of setting up another damage dealer, but he himself requires setup. Uh, people think he's kind of okay. You can see it's sort of 4 to 4.5. He's okay. I don't know. Like, do, do any of you actually use Roxanne for anything huge? For Hydra, you know, maybe he's going to put Veils on himself. The stun and sleep wouldn't do anything, but AoE decreased defense and weaken is really good. So I don't know. And like, he's going to give himself a lot of nice buffs. You just have to be careful that they're not stolen. I'd say for Hydra, he's a pretty decent, tanky, perfect, self-failing attacker. He might be okay, um, but certainly not the draw of this event. The big one that you certainly want to get is Draco Morph. When I started playing the game, he was considered the best legendary in the game, pretty much. Like, way up there anyway. Uh, not as mandatory anymore with Lydia coming out. Draco Morph, though, has actually a pretty cool A1. Attacks one enemy. Damage increases by 10% for each debuff on the target. And then attacks a random enemy with any surplus damage if the target is killed. The damage inflicted is equal to triple the surplus damage, but it cannot be critical. So it's a hard-hitting A1 if they've got lots of debuffs. And then if he kills a target in, like, dungeon waves or an arena or whatever, it zaps over to the next person, which is pretty cool. His A2 then, Poison Jaws. Four-time attack at random. Three-turn cooldown when booked. Each hit puts 5% Poison debuff for three turns against single target bosses so the demon lord clan boss this is a huge hit a four hitting attack that's putting four five percent poisons for three turns this is a monstrous amount of damage against those single target bosses then his a3 baleful eye books to a three turn cooldown places 25 percent weaken and 60 percent decreased defense debuff on all enemies for two turns so he just goes out and places it on a really short cooldown he brings accuracy and faction crypts as well but he's considered one of the best champions for for demon lord like he comes in he brings you decreased defense and weaken and then he brings you a massive hit with a whole ton of poison damage and then a really hard hitting A1. He's in a lot of top clan boss teams. He's obviously going to be great for Dragon's Lair. He's going to be okay for Arena, though Lydia is certainly a lot better than he is, I would say. Um, and yeah, that's, that's sort of it. He's decent across the board. He's going to be decent across the board, guys. Not too bad. He's not as crazy as he was when I first started, but he's really solid. Like if I look at my clan here, 
uh, and I'll show you the voids then. If I look at my clan, wait, no, I'm on the wrong account. I can't show you my clan, but on my new clan, like a lot of people run him in their bad eater compositions, right? A lot of people run him and I think he is very solid. Now for the voids, we have two voids. Um, actually before the void, yeah, l no, let me show you the voids and then I'll tell you if I would be pulling stuff or not. Uh, you can sort of get my vibe, I think, a bit already. Uh, the Void Epic that you can get this weekend, 10 times, is Skull Crown. So Skull Crown is either the best or second best. She's kind of tied with Genbo, I think, for um, Void AoE nukers, Arena nukers. Her A1, Wave of Souls, attacks all enemies, does an extra hit if the target is more than 50% HP. So very hard-hitting AoE A1. Her A2 is an AoE attack, which has a 75% chance when booked of putting weakened for two turns. That has a three-turn cooldown when it's booked. And then her passes is what really makes her special. Resilient puts Unkillable on her for one turn whenever her HP drops below 20%. Four-turn cooldown when booked. And then if she's going in with Sinatia, um, she actually has a, a self-revive as well. She also brings 23% speed aura in arena battles. So for mid-game players especially, she is a beast a beast in the arena. She gives you a really good arena aura. That's going to be better than anything you have until, uh, before you get Arbiter. So that's really good. And she also hits very, very hard. You actually don't want to even bother building her with accuracy. You just build her to hit as hard as possible. Her speed doesn't even need to be crazy high. Just boost her attack super high, crit damage really high. She's not going to die. She can only be crowd controlled, right? But she won't die to damage. So for that early mid game arena, she is hor horrific, horrific for the enemies to fight. She She's going to absolutely smash them with Corrupting Touch. Wave of Souls. Build her with a Retribution Mastery so she can counterattack. You can put her in counterattacking sets. She's going to be a beast. Um, in Blender teams, which is like you ally attack with a bunch of AoE A1s, her and her sister Sinatia together will absolutely nuke, right? She'll come in, you do an ally attack move, she attacks, does a double hit because they're above 50% HP, and then if she brings them below 50% HP, Sinatia, her sister, comes in, and she does an extra hit on enemies with less than 50% HP. So you put the two of them in there together, especially when you get Arbiter, and it makes her a very fast arena speed farm. Not quite as relevant these days with reaction accessories, but still pretty good so yeah skull crown is fantastic epic she's actually very very good um i even still use her a bit in some arena stuff with with counter attack and things like that you can definitely do some cheesy things so she's a very solid uh champion she can campaign farm as well if you need her to uh she's gonna be good for nuking through doom tower stuff um especially normal doom tower she's gonna rip through it that sort of thing so not terrible and then basically we have Uber uh, Skull Crown is the final champion. And that is Leorius the Proud, one of the more recent Void Legendaries added to the game. And what a beast, what a beast. So his A1 attacks one enemy two times. Each hit has a chance of a 60% chance of putting decreased defense for two turns. Damage increases by 20% if the target has less than 60% HP. So it's a big hard hitting A1 that can place decreased defense, though you're probably not gonna value accuracy overly much on this champion. Rage of the Pride, this is an amazing ability. Three turn cooldown, attacks all enemies two times, hits like a truck, but more importantly is the passive effect. He is immune to stuns, freeze, sleep, provoke, fear, true fear, and petrification debuffs when this skill is not on cooldown. So you go into the arena and he cannot be crowd controlled. You can't crowd control him, right? He is going to smack you. So what do you do? Uh, awesome Roar then is the thing he's probably going to smack you with. Attacks all enemies, has a 100% chance of putting true fear for one turn. Before attacking, has a 100% chance of putting weaken on all enemies for two turns. So this is, you know, where that accuracy does become kind of useful. But you probably just want to build him to smack hard because of his passive. True Grit. Instantly puts Unkillable on him for one turn before receiving a fatal hit that has a four turn cooldown. And his damage increases as his HP decreases. So you go into Arena, right? When you, when you start the arena fight, he's completely immune to all crowd control. Uh, if you do any damage, if you knock him down to one HP, he survives unkillable and he can't be crowd controlled. He's gonna do 99% more damage and he is just going to absolutely rip you a new one. He's gonna tear you apart with, with probably with awesome roar. So he absolutely smashes. Because he, by the way, has two AOE attacks, he's actually fantastic for PVE farming as well. Campaign farming, dungeons, uh, Doom Tower stuff. He's gonna rip through those waves with absolutely huge single target damage. Um, 
And yeah, I think there there is some viability with building him with a- accuracy stuff if you're going to use him more in PvE. But he's like pretty much the top tier void nuker. Solus arguably is 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 better. I don't know. Solus is a defensive nuker. From attack nuker perspective, Leorius is certainly the best one for the voids. It's kind of like Ethos and Skullcrown had a baby uh, that somehow turned out to be a cat. Um, but yeah, he's I like crit rate in all battles as well. But yeah, he's a monster. He is an absolute monster. Very scary to fight. Basically, what you're looking to do is you, you kind of want to buff strip him if possible or like decrease his attack. Uh, but yeah, he's he's tough to deal with. Very tough to deal with. Yeah, very, very strong. Five stars there for arena offense. People really liking this guy. You can see how good he is. So there you go. They are the, the pulls that are going to be boosted this week uh, weekend. Are they worth pulling for? Well, here's the thing, guys. For the Let's do voids first. For the voids, I think if you are a whale, you are going for Leorius, right? If you are a whale player, you're going for Leorius. He's such a monster in, in Platinum Arena. I think you're definitely going for him. There's supposed to be lots of PvP content coming this year in Raid. So whales will go for him. I think for regular players, unless you are like way deep into your Void Mercy timer and you know that you're guaranteed to get an Epic or a Legendary... Uh, more so the legendary i'd probably avoid it i really recommend for low spend free to play early mid game players especially save your voids for two times voids you don't get that many void champions you really want to make sure just to get as many epics and legendaries as possible and two times is, is the best way to do that so i wouldn't recommend it for the regular shards so your ancients your sacreds ancients not very good in summon rush so you're more so going for sacreds and I don't know. I don't know. I like if it, if it, I think you're going to have to pull if you need fragments for Oprah and you're going to have to pull, but you're mostly honestly expecting to get the epics. And I think the epics are pretty underwhelming. I don't think they're that good. Um I think they're only average. I think if you happen to pick them up on an early game account if you're going for Oprah and early in the game and this is your fusion, yeah, you'll find use for them especially if you're struggling with Fire Knight. They're going to be good there. Right, they're going to be fine for that, especially if you put them with the Operden that you fuse. He'll heal you through all of Fire Knight, and they'll help you keep that shield down. I think that is actually quite quite nifty, quite useful. They'll be okay for Hydra as well, so it's going to be okay. Um, the Legendaries, again, I feel like Roxam and Suzerain Catone are pretty average. I think Dracomorph is the big draw for early game players. You know, if you're pulling early game with a couple of Sacreds, maybe two or three Sacreds, whatever you need to get the the, the five, I presume, low tier fragments from this summon event. Dracomorph is the thing you're hoping to see. Absolutely. He'll be a game changer for your account if you get him early. Absolute beast. I think for whales, though, I, I'd like to get him. And I, I don't know, though, if I'll pull any shards. I might even hope to skip this event entirely, to be honest. Because, yeah, Dracomorph is badass. He's really cool. But Lydia has a better decreased defense and weakened move. Um, so, yeah, Dracomorph is good. But I don't know if I really need him anywhere. You know what I mean? Do we really need him? It's tough to say. So there we go, guys. Let me know what you think. Are you going to pull this weekend? What do you think of these guys? Especially with those epics. Do you you use them for anything that I have missed? Let me know. Roxam as well. Let me know. But guys, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.